Okay, good morning everybody. Um, welcome to the destination day at the ITB Berlin 2018. Today's topic, over tourism, is also one of the topics or the main theme for the whole IBT, uh, ITB convention this year. And we really have quite a good program for you for, for this morning and for the afternoon as well. Now, over tourism is something that we read about a lot in the papers. Um, big cruise ships driving through Venice. Um, filled places in everywhere from Sydney, um, the Great Ocean Road being overrun, European destinations flooded with tourists, locals dispersed from their homes to make way for Airbnb. At least these are the stories we hear. So today we've gathered a group of different opinions for you that will hopefully help us to highlight the, um, the impact that over-tourism is having on some destinations within Europe and abroad. We may want to talk about some of the causes, what is actually causing this over-tourism phenomena. Some might think it's a great thing. Those destinations that don't have enough tourists would like to have too many, maybe, until they have too many and then they want to go back. So it's a matter, matter of planning properly and finding the right balance. And we're also going to talk about solutions. Hopefully, not just solutions for some of the symptoms that we see. So, overbooked museums, too many people at certain attractions at certain times, but the actual problems. How can we change tourism policy, tourism strategy, and the way that we plan our tourism destinations to make sure that we don't have these issues in the future? I think in this whole discussion, we can agree that in some places there are too many visitors. In certain locations, at certain times, certain times of the year, certain time of the day. So it's really a matter of yield management. It's something that we've seen in other industries already. And maybe one of the solutions in the end might be looking at how we measure tourism. You see it in most of the presentations that everyone's talking about numbers. Do we really want more and more and more tourists? One of the questions that I think we'll be discussing at some stage today is what kind of tourists do we want? Is one tourist the same as another? Or should we be looking at what kind of yield we want to gain from tourism as a whole to make sure that we can then attract the right type of tourists to help us achieve those financial goals in the destination? Now, the balance between economic success, social sustainability of a destination, so not displacing people from, their, from the center of cities to make way for tourists, and also the ecological carrying capacity of destinations are all topics that we will talk about today with different experts in the field. So, first of all today, at 11 o'clock, I have the great pleasure of um, introducing you to colleagues from the German Society of Tourism Research, as well as the International Association of Scientists, Scientific Experts in Tourism, who will present an exclusive study that they did for the ITB on the status quo of over-tourism, what some of the measures might be that destinations can take in order to address this issue, and what some of the best practices are in Europe. And then there will be an interesting discussion off the back of that to see how this can be applied. At 12 o'clock, we will then speak to some of the affected destinations. I will lead a panel with the Mayor of Dubrovnik and the Head of Marketing for Amsterdam Tourism, as well as the Head of, Marketing for, or the Head of Tourism for Barcelona City, to talk about what impact over-tourism has had on these destinations that are often, often in the media for being the sort of main destinations in Europe hit with over-tourism. Of course, there are many more, but hopefully they can give us some idea of the kind of solutions that they are working towards in order to address over-tourism. At one o'clock, we then turn our attention to the cruise industry. Now, in some Caribbean nations, as well as throughout the Mediterranean, cruise ships have had an impact on many small destinations because they cause over-tourism in a way 
in very short periods of time when huge ships dock in small islands and flood them with people. The cruise industry is growing hugely, and the panel at one o'clock will talk about how they can manage this growth, remain profitable, and look towards the future. Two o'clock, we will then look at land-based operations. We will look at accommodation and the sharing economy. Many destinations have struggled with regulation um, on these sort of secondary home lending operations. So is it really a challenge or is it an opportunity for destination? Is it a competition to a hotel or is it an alternative means of accommodation? At three o'clock, um, one of our session partners, Studiosus, will then present a talk on the sustainability of the latest tourism boom in Greece. Re Greece is coming to the end of support from the European Union. They will have to stand on their own two feet again. So is this tourism boom in Greece a blessing for them? And can they keep it up? Well, that remains to be seen. You will have to join us at 3 o'clock for this discussion. At 4 o'clock, we then take a look at how travel brands, and I'm sure there are some representatives of travel brands in the room right now, can, can um, address the Chinese millennials, which are quite a large target market for, for all of you, I'm sure. And um, there'll be some interesting insights in there on how we can use these millennials to achieve, um, achieve growth. At 5 o'clock, Last but not least, so those of you who will still join us at 5 o'clock, we will have the ITB Ministers' Roundtable, where we will discuss tourism policy and what contribution this can make to managing tourism destinations, tourism strategy, making sure that it's a sustainable, and maybe avoiding over-tourism before it ever happens. So there I will be discussing Tourism policy with the tourism ministers of Albania, India, Jamaica, Jordan, as well as the head of the Qatar Tourism Development Authority to really talk about how they are using policy measures to address over-tourism and drive their destinations forward. So as you can see, we have a great variety of speakers to address this one very important topic. We will talk about impacts that it's had on destinations. We will talk about causes, symptoms, and the real problems. And then we will talk about solutions. And then, at the end of this day, hopefully all of you will take some lessons from this and be able to apply this in your destinations and your businesses to make sure that tourism can grow sustainably into the future. So, that's what's in store for you today. Of course, all of this is not possible without some administration in the background. And we have some very interesting ideas there as well. So there's going to be a very talented graphical artist. Her name is Ms. Halamoda. She will join sessions throughout the day, not just here, but in the other rooms as well. And she will draw pictures of the sessions. So she will graphically record what is being said and these pictures will then be exhibited out in the hall, and they're actually going to make a book out of it. So you'll be able to read the ITB convention in pictures drawn by Ms. Halamoda later in the year. Another thing that's been introduced is live voting. If you reach to the right of your chairs, you should have a little clicking device. And throughout the day, the session presenters, or myself, we will we will put questions up for you. We'll, we'll try one of these in a minute to get everything started. You can, you can try your hand at clicking. And that will give us some feedback from the audience to see what you think about certain issues. So you are part of this discussion today. Unfortunately, in such a big room, it's not possible to, to raise hands and hand around microphones. So instead, we're going to use these live voting devices, which will help us get your um, your opinion on these topics as well. So please join in and tell us what you think. In the end, um, there's too many great sessions at this ITB convention for you to see all of them. Um, all of you are missing other sessions right now to be here. 
But luckily for you, they're all being recorded in the main halls, and they will be posted on the ITB Convention's YouTube channel, um, the recordings, so you can actually watch those sessions that you've missed afterwards and still get some of the insights from them. They generate hundreds and hundreds of hours of video here every year, so there's, there's plenty of procrastination there for you if you ever don't feel like working. Last but not least, um, I'd like to thank the sponsors for the, for the ITB convention and to, to make this happen, to bring you this program. This year we have Zambia as the ITB's convention and culture partner for the year. And we have the World Tourism Cities Federation as co-host. So thank you to them for the whole, hosting the whole um, convention. Then we have the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, who is also a platinum sponsor of the, of the convention. Today's Destination Day is brought to you by the MC Group, um, who, will, who will be hosting this day for... And then last but not least, the Studiosus sponsors one of the sessions this afternoon at 3 o'clock, and they will also be there presenting, um, presenting the session and talking about the growth of tourism in Greece. So, a lot to do today, so I think we should just get straight into it. So, everyone get out your clickers. Should be on your right if you reach down. So, if we could have the first question. So, the first question for today, we've talked a lot about over-tourism, but how big will the over-tourism problem really be in the future? What is your opinion? So you can vote now. <laughs> well, OK. That's quite clear. So it is going to be a problem in the future, um, which is very good that we asked this at the start of the day, because now we can use the whole day to try and find some solutions for this together. And for the first session now, it is my, um, my great honor as a long-term IEST member to introduce you to, to you three, three gentlemen who know this topic better than anyone. Um, they've studied this for the ITB. They've put together an exclusive report relating to the status quo, the measures, and best practice examples for over-tourism in Europe. So please welcome to the stage to present these, um, these findings now, exclusively here at the ITB, um, Professor Dr. Jürgen Schmuder, the President of the German Society of Tourism Research, um, Professor Dr. Harald Pechlaner, the President of the IEST, and Professor Dr. Christian Lesser, the Secretary General of the IEST. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, my dear and herren. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you on behalf of DGT and IEST. Today, we're going to present our findings of our research to you. First of all, I'm going to talk about development and the theoretical background. Then I will hand over to uh, Mr. Harald Pechlein, who's going to talk about the empirical findings of the study. Maybe yesterday, night you had the possibility to listen to the opening speeches there wasn't a an opening speech which didn't mention the term over-tourism. Mrs. Merkel pointed out that this phenomenon did not, it does not exist in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, for instance. There are many synonyms for this term over-tourism, and if we take a look at the media, how the media reports on this topic, then we can see that in any case in the German-speaking countries, um, there is no newspaper which uh, does not report on uh, over-tourism by using various uh, terms. There is a professional journal such as Travel One, uh, just one example on the slide. They have also reported on this topic. 
At the moment, we've got uh, quite a range of conferences dedicated to the topic of overtourism. In October, Harald Pechleiner and myself had the pleasure to take part in talks about overtourism. Here we can see it is an important issue at ITB. Next week there will be a conference in Bautzen on this topic. So even in academic circles this topic is being discussed. And we can see that now we've got the first scientific reports in professional journals. You can see this is the Journal of Destination Marketing and Management uh, with an article on the topic or tourism future. A call for a special issue uh, was uh, issued just a few days ago. Uh, this is about uh, over tourism again. It was a or will be published in the journal Tourism Planning and Development. In academic circles, this uh, topic is being discussed at the moment. But we can actually see that this is not a new issue. We have this discussion in the 1980s and in the 1990s as well. Well, then it wasn't called over-tourism, of course, but uh, what people talked about was rather the development of concepts for soft tourism. Later on, this was called sustainable tourism. Uh, in any case, the older colleagues amongst, amongst us are familiar with a uh, report by Robert Young, this was kind of a starting point. He asked, how many tourists can you gather on one hect hectare of beach? Or there's still the book by Jos Christian Wolf, the Die Ferien mentioned. This is still worthwhile to read it. Or talking about concepts, uh, still uh, the term overtourism wasn't uh, mentioned. It was uh, called carrying capacity. Uh, Swarbrook uh, published a book at the end of the 1990s. It's also worth it to read this book. Um, he talked about the various types of carrying capacity. Uh, then uh, we also find a modification and an enlargement of these uh, concepts. Uh, Joan Mansfield from Israel, for instance, develop the carrying capacity value stretch model. First and fo foremost, uh, this is dedicated to social cultural carrying capacities. The problem is that this is a very versatile problem. And if we take a look at the various types of carrying capacity, then we can see the physical or infrastructure carrying capacity. That is, how many cruise ships can uh, uh, be uh, can enter a port. This is an example from Istanbul. Or uh, the question may be raised, how many tourists uh, can be gathered in a hotspot? This is the cave of Lascaux. This is an interesting solution of the problem that we can find here. The cave was rebuilt, so the tourists do not enter the original one any longer. But this is not something that we can use as a solution for cities, of course. Moreover, and this is a long-standing tradition. We've got the problem of the ecological carrying capacity. Then we face the problem of socio-cultural carrying capacity, especially with a view to the discussions of developing countries and tourism in these developing countries. This is an important issue. In today's discussion, there's something which plays a major role and this is the perceptual or psychological carrying capacity. And these are the events which made the headlines in the press last summer where local residents in Dubrovnik felt um, harassed by tourists. And this was just the example of Dubrovnik. Then there's also the problem of economic carrying capacity. Tourism results in certain areas of everyday life being affected. For instance, when it comes to providing housing, Airbnb is just one important keyword here, where local residents have genuine local, uh, sorry, economic disadvantages when it comes to um, housing or available on the general real estate market. In other words, this is a multi-tiered problem. There are various stakeholders who are affected. It starts with the local residents, goes via the DMOs, etc. They 
are confronted with the problem of managing this problem. But then there's also a problem of infrastructure. There's a problem of natural resources. And for Regarding scientists or academics, we can say that there is a whole range of challenges that we need to accept so as to tackle the problem. First of all, how relevant is the topic? Is it just a hype? Maybe next year it will not be topical any longer. We can rather say that this will not be the case if we take a look at, uh, for instance, the publications of the UNWTO. They forecast arrivals of tourism uh, between 1.2 billion in 2017 to uh, uh, 1.8 billion in 2030. This will be an increase to the tune of 50 percent. However, there's also the problem that we don't have a clear-cut definition. What is over-tourism at all? How can we define this? Let alone the question, which is the following one, how can we measure over-tourism? Is there any yardstick or is, is there any figure which can provide us with information regarding a red line which might have been exceeded? How can we manage this whole thing? How do the various people and stakeholders affected react? And this is the starting situation or the initial situation which we were facing when we started thinking about the study to be conducted for ITB. And my colleague Harald Pechleiner is now going to present the results. I would like to thank Professor Schmude for the, his introductory remarks of this topic, you can see that we're discussing a phenomenon that we need to do define, first of all. This is an important uh, task for academics. We also need to see what is the site guide, and we need to ask what is the cause for the problem. Why is this an issue at all? We suppose that this is not just a media hype, but that this is a, a relevant problem of the tourism sector. and. A pertinent sectors of economic and political life. We uh, talked to Professor Conradi, the uh, head of the ITB convention, and we then started two kinds of studies which actually have not been finalized so far, but we can present the first results. This is the qualitative part of the study. However, the quantitative part of the study has not been finalized. We still need to finish this. But we can show you, uh, we conducted 19 interviews. It sounds not too many, but at the end of the day, this is actually quite a lot. We then evaluated this study. That is, we evaluated the interviews together with Garbig Vinrilan. These are guideline supported narrative interviews with open questions. It is very time, time consuming to code this. The complexity needs to be reduced. We then categorized this into pieces of individual senses and then we uh, used keywords so as to assess the interviews. Uh, then we can uh, display this in graphs and this after having reduced complexity we thus gather new data. So as I said, there were 19 interviews altogether. It doesn't sound too many, but at the end we had approximately 1,400 uh, phrases, 1,400 phrases and related thoughts. And I can tell you it was about uh, local residents, uh, tourists, guests. At the end of the day, this is the issue of the relationship between the local residents, whoever that might be in the given case, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the tourists and the guests on the other hand. And uh, a lot of the aspects of social sustainability are also um, connected to this. At the end, uh, we had 76,000 connections between the phrases. In Europe, we try to um, distribute this evenly, but this is our catchment area, as we can see here. 
it was really very exciting to uh, do these interviews because it's uh, it's not uh, automatic that these interviews mentioned uh, over tourism because we realized that the destinations are not really linked to over tourism they don't do not want to be linked to over tourism there are only a courageous few who proactively tackle this issue and see this as an opportunity to raise the basic question to ask what uh, does the future of tourism look like in our destination, how will it develop further in the future? And we see a central value there. Overtourism should be seen as the basis for a new strategy or for uh, overhauling the strategic foundations of the destination development seen altogether. Overtourism might be a term uh, that gives you cause for concern, but finally it's about the limits of carrying capacity. Uh, col my colleague Mr. Schmude mentioned this uh, carrying capacity already, and there are various approaches for these felt carrying capacities, for instance, the psychological carrying capacity. It's not an ideal term, but it might be exactly the term which is needed by the tourism sector so as to make things happen so that stakeholders can be involved in the discussion who might not have been involved earlier on. So we've seen that it is about strategic issues, questions such as do we have the right type of tourism, do we have the guests we want to have, what do we need to do uh, so as to develop alternative products, so as to make it possible to have a demand which also takes into account the requirements of the local residents, something that would be positive for the destination. On the other hand, we've got operative questions such as limits, taxation, and other issues. And this is something that my colleague, Mr. Lesser, is going to discuss with you later on. Now, here you can see the various uh, connections of phrases I mentioned. It looks very complicated indeed. Still, I'm trying to show you at top speed what this means. I already said the guest-host relationship is very important. There is this connection between guests and hosts. Uh, hospitality it's just an example. There are protests, uh, which might be loud or not as loud, uh, protests of the local residents. It's about the acceptance of uh, guests, uh, whether they are accepted by the local uh, residents who see overcrowding. So it's very important with acceptance how the guests actually behave. So we have tensions between the, in the relationships between the hosts and the guests. And there the companies are very important, and of course especially the staff. So if uh, you want to discuss over tourism, then you also need to talk to the companies, the management uh, and staff. So staff could be trained, that may be one aspect uh, which could play a role here. Hospitality is of great importance uh, and uh, it, uh, it is acceptancy which is at stake. We've seen this tension between urban uh, catchment areas and rural areas. And uh, as you saw, on the one hand, we have uh, players in uh, the cities and, on the other hand, uh, in the rural areas. That was very important to us. It's uh, very important to see this discussion, uh, especially in the cities. We know about the cities. We've had this discussion there, but we believe that over-tourism is something which also affects the rural areas or could affect them. That could be having to close mountain roads in the Alps or it could be a re kind of a resistance of the local population against uh, mass events. That could be something you could find in rural areas. And that doesn't necessarily have a connection with the quantitative uh, issue of uh, tourism outcome, but as to what the locals would like to see and how many guests they can bear in their area. Now, if we go into the cities, then, of course, uh, certain things have to be done in um, regard with regards to overcrowding and overtourism, especially when we have very high concentration of visitors at certain hotspots. At the end of the day, it will also be about uh, how we will be able to manage uh, to keep visitors at certain 
hotspots or to rather see to it that they don't remain there too long. We need to manage the flows. Now, attractions outside the centers, for example, that would be a point, but that's not so easy. People want to go in. And the more international tourism we have, which we propagate everywhere, the more these visitors will also want to go into the hotspots in the city centers. So we'll have to allow them in. But the question is, how long are they going to remain there? And do we have alternatives then so that we can also send them to other places or steer them uh, to other areas? Traffic problems, problems with waste and noise, these are very important issues connected uh, with uh, tourism, especially when uh, talking to the locals. We heard that. Um, in the interviews. And uh, so the question is what we can do. So can we have the rural surrounding areas of the cities and have it integrated into our total strategy? So we shouldn't say, no, we're only going to have the rural areas so that we can avoid over-tourism in the city centers. No, uh, we need to somehow dissolve the di dichotomy between the cities and the rural areas. And uh, in our interviews, we heard about uh, the phenomenon of over-tourism and overcrowding, but it was not seen as a problem, not so much. But in the rural areas, very often, tourism is perceived as uh, to be a very highly relevant uh, economic factor, and uh, you cannot go against it. That's the one side. On the other hand, in the rural areas, very often we have uh, small companies, uh, family companies in the area of hospitality or restoration. And uh, that is also a factor which is not as, which does not see negative aspects of uh, uh, tourism. To the right, you can see the rural destinations and uh, leadership is necessary here in the area of marketing and product development. Uh, a decentralization of the structures is something which is advocated. Then we have this destination marketing or destination management organizations. We would say last, the latter is more important. Marketing should maybe also be redefined, though, on this background. And uh, we will have to make sure that the relationship between the visitors and the hosts are well balanced. Because if we're going to be honest, we haven't bothered about it too much over the last decades. We wanted to have attractive uh, um, points uh, of interest. Uh, that was interesting to us. We wanted people to be enthusiastic about that, to have um, experiences in that. And we didn't so much look at the locals and didn't integrating them seriously into the whole project. So this will have to change, and uh, destination management will have to be redefined. That is what we can read from the interviews. It's the basic concept. But we do see that DMO, the destination management officer, is very careful here. They'd rather do it, uh, manage things lightly, rather than uh, using severe measures, which is something I will get back to later. Now, the strategy. On the one hand, we have the institutional level, we have the different levels of organizations and cooperational groups, which will have to steer the process. But on the other hand, we also have concrete examples where you can see a quality increase in the area of um, 
hospitality and guiding is also very important. I'll get back to that later as well. Very important in the interviews was the question as to whether it would be possible to achieve a kind of alternative product launching. So you have, uh, apart from the usual well-known product development paths, that you have new alternatives. And uh, using these alternative offers, you can then integrate the local population. And um, of course, steering mechanisms, that's very important. Which kind of possibilities do we have to measure this? Digitalization is something which helps the destinations because then you have evidence-based data which can be generated so that you can quickly introduce new attractions or point out to new attractions so that people can visit those within their destination. Central measures, which were mentioned several times, you can see them above, are uh, the different uh, tracking tools for monitoring so that you can have sensitization strategies. And then we have the context we can see to the left, below, and down, and, and above. Uh, limiting action is not so much uh, wanted, but proactive uh, conscience, awareness rising, acceptance of tourism, those are things which are <coughs> mentioned uh, in the interviews. Then uh, steering the visitor groups or fluxes uh, to manage overcrowding there in the destinations there. You can steer this by uh, concrete uh, marketing of alternative um, attractions. Again, it will have to be the DMO, but uh, the focus should be on the rural areas around the destination. So the destination also changes its portfolio so as uh, to distribute the visitor groups better in space and time. In national parks or na nature-based tourism, this is uh, very much so possible, and it's been mentioned uh, so and so often in the interviews. Now, limitations there, it's more about uh, steering rather than having contingency management. Now, whether or not that it will be sufficient, that is something uh, which um, my colleague, uh, Professor Christian Lesser, will tell you about later. Now, here you can see that it's of crucial importance to solve uh, conflicts of interest and to have in understanding. So this is also a preventive measure for destinations uh, who have this uh, or do not yet have over-tourism or don't perceive it as being over-tourism because where it's already be perceived, uh, it's too late, so to speak. Over-tourism is a phenomenon which can be a good uh, foundation for a new sustainability offensive, to call it like that. Now, we're talking about limitation in quantity and especially with the DMOs, uh, limitation of numbers of beds, for example, are mentioned as a possible strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe we are confronted with a paradigm shift. We don't focus uh, merely on the touristic experience area, but we are now turning to the life of the local population, dialogue management could be a term which could be used here. It's about strategic and operative uh, questions. So steering visitors, that's the one thing. But on the other hand, it's the question what kind of tourism you want to have at this destination. So if you're just going to steer and manage, that uh, would uh, probably not be sufficient. Each destination is unique, and uh, this uniqueness will also require certain measures. And the tools or instruments may at the end of the day be the same, but how to implement them and uh, what uh, policy 
to implement. That is the challenge in destination management for the political stakeholders. In one of the interviews, uh, not for this study, but somewhere else, said, what's this, all this about? Are we talking about over-tourism or are we talking about under-management? Probably, apart from the operational aspect as to steering the visitors at touristic destinations, we will also have to answer the question as what kind of tourism we want to have in the future. So thank you very much for listening, and we will now start our discussion. Christian. Christian, you're an economist well known for very direct and clear language you use. So what would you say? What about this phenomenon of over-tourism? We saw in the first voting session this morning that this topic obviously is relevant and it will remain relevant over time. But what's it all about? Well, it's a very good uh, topic uh, for research. And it's also a problem which is to be solved. But before talking about solutions, we will have to see what the reasons are. I think that lying behind this, tourism, unfortunately, is a phenomenon where uh, we have private profits being made by companies. And we also have uh, losses, which are socialized, which I would call it, uh, like to call it that. And I, by that, I mean that negative effects um, are not always the, the people um, suffering the negative effects are not always the same ones making the profits. And that's because tourism is in the public sphere. And the public sphere, of course, is open to everybody. And uh, we believe that uh, we cannot limit public space. So I'll just leave it at this. So we have this problem that we have private uh, profits and uh, public losses. So that is the basis from which I'm going to start out as a starting point. Now, looking at this today, then usually there are several reasons for this. And so this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So it's got something to do with demand, but it's also got something to do with the offer. So I'll start with the offer. In the past uh, 20 years, we had uh, huge, a huge increase of capacities in, on the offer side. We had the low-cost airlines in the transport area. And uh, suddenly, it's not about money anymore if you want to fly very far. It's not about whether or not uh, you have the money to pay for this, but only whether you have the time. So we have uh, masses of uh, people, more people traveling. And then a new phenomenon is the peer-to-peer -peer economy. I'm just mentioning Airbnb. And there we also have uh, masses um, in the hospitality sector. So <clears throat> then we have the cruise industry as well. So there we have uh, <coughs> transport and hospitality, and there we have uh, this component on the side of the office. And then if I look at the demand side, then I have a recipe for disaster, I might say, because uh, we have two developments in parallel. On the one hand, we have the intercontinentalization of tourism or internationalization of tourism. So. We don't have uh, people who went somewhere for the very first time. They don't go out into the desert or something. And then we have uh, also regionally speaking, and I'm in Europe here now, we have amount, an increase in quantity. So we have an increased demand and offer, and we have a demand structure which has been observed as we saw today. 
so a clear analysis on the one hand, and that's really interesting. We have the people who are traveling for the first time. Then we have strong internationalization. We also heard about that in the study. And on the other hand, we also have an increased uh, offer. Let's uh, get back to the drivers, uh, digitization, Airbnb, these things maybe are particularly possible because of digitization. What else uh, at an economic, uh, even global level, what else is a driver for over-tourism? Well, internationally speaking, we've never been as unfree to travel as we are today. A hundred or 150 years ago, if you wanted to go somewhere, you could go there. There was no, there were no visa. There was uh, hardly any limitation for traveling. The problem was just transport, or it might have been too expensive. You couldn't afford it. But digitization has, of course, made things uh, quicker, more ubiquitous. I can uh, make short-term decisions. Uh, within two minutes, I can book a hotel somewhere that's completely different. It's not a hurdle anymore. I used to have to go to a travel agency, and then I needed to search for information. All that was quite cumbersome. And uh, now this is uh, so much faster, and I can be more impulsive. On Thursday, I can decide that on Friday, I'm going to fly somewhere, and I'll come back on Sunday. And of course, uh, that means that traveling has become quicker. And uh, that is something which you could also, of course, uh, have under the category of demand. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we could also ask colleagues maybe to have the second public vo voting question. So it's up to you again now. The question is, in your opinion, the most. Whatever you, you will see here some answers uh, here, which is what uh, Christian Lesser said. So please hear now. It's up to you to cast your vote. I'm excited. Yeah, I think this is wieder. Well, yeah, quite intriguing to see this. Uh, so, Christian, maybe you would like to interpret the result. Growth of tourism demand in general. Now, number one, two, three are the facilitators. The, that's the basis for number four, for having the number four. So I would also agree that um, I said that we had international tourism. If I know that in China and in India, I have 20 to 30 million new people who are entering the middle classes, then that is a kind of a perpetuum mobile for growth. And uh, I think uh, we can stop marketing our destinations because people will just keep on coming all the time anyway. They want to travel. It's not that people don't want to travel. Human beings want to travel. We just need to prepare, open the cashier, and then uh, make the most money we can as soon as they're there. But then, of course, uh, we could improve some things when talking about making money. I think there's more to be done yet. And that is now the introduction to the second point of the discussion. We will talk about uh, measuring, about limitations in the study. Then we had some interview partners who were angry about the fact that uh, certain people demand an upper limit. So there are different uh, proposals as to how to tackle the phenomenon depending on the perceived situation. But on the other hand, we also have the need for tools uh, to be able to manage this phenomenon. So my question for you, we talked about why, the why, but now how can we measure these uh, phenomena and can we manage them somehow? 
Well, with your first question again, I'd like to dive into the water before I um, dive out of it again. So uh, it's mostly a perception problem, if, whether or not we think that we have very many tourists. Now we know we have two sides. We have the tourism industry in the larger sense of the word, of the term. So people making money of tourism. And then we have very many institutions uh, uh, who or people who receive the negative impact of this. And um, before talking about specific uh, measures, we will first have to have a political dialogue, what you mentioned with this uh, dialogue context there, so that we can agree, maybe not agree, but at least get a feeling for where the thresholds could be. And it should always be in a certain context. You can't have one threshold, uh, f one size fits all, but you have certain limitations for certain cities, for example, depends, and that would have to be negotiated between the people who benefit from tourism and those who suffer from it. And you should do that so that the um, government doesn't have to intervene. That would be the worst case scenario. I think we need dialogue on both sides so that um, everybody is um, being heard as a stakeholder. So when do both sides, for example, realize that the problem is a problem? That's when we talk about limitations, for example. And then if I now go out and look at the bigger picture, then I could say that, OK, I'd like to have a kind of uh, like an escalation staircase. Uh, you talked about this with the limitations uh, in capacities you were talking about. And now with uh, the different steps we could take. Again, we could escalate. We could say, OK, information, and we need to convince people that's something which is fairly quickly possible. So marketing is not just fetching people, but it also means uh, that you inform people and tell them when they should come ideally and how to come. And um, here, I must say, we haven't done anything yet. The message here would be if you have just advertisement, then if you say just come, then 100,000 others will also come. Now, the second step is uh, to make some limitations where I want to do that. For example, with a reservation system, so that you don't have people in front of closed doors and cannot enter an object or a city or a location. Contingencies, that was uh, the buzzword here. That is something which can, theoretically speaking, be quickly implemented. As soon as I've decided how much uh, the location can bear, then the question of using prices. Barcelona, for example, you have a five-fold tourism taxes now. And so if you then use some of the money and give it to the people who suffer from the negative impact of tourism, then maybe <coughs> the situation can be eased somewhat. Then the fourth uh, step, Harald, you said that you could uh, do some planning and try to do what Sydney did. They're trying it quite desperately, actually, trying to get people out of the city center and uh, sending them to the south or up to Newcastle or something like that, or creating artificial uh, attraction points. For example, Disney uh, next to Paris there, they're still investing even more. So that could also ease the pressure on the city center. And then you should uh, not just look at the locals and see how it could be beneficial for them, but also for the tourists, because at the end of the day, the tourists will also benefit from being uh, in a nice surroundings where they don't have to use their elbows to see attractions. 
Very good. Thank you, Christian Lesser, for these three, four very tangible ideas as to how to tackle the phenomenon of over-tourism and overcrowding. And uh, thereby, I would uh, like to ask the colleagues from the desk, please show us your third public voting question. Put it up here. Which of the following bundles of measures for visitor flow management do you prefer? And uh, the four answers you can see here are the four bundles of measures Professor Lesser just uh, explained to us. Please use your voting machines. Just the time. It keeps not adding up. Girl. Okay. Christian. Nicht ein, es ist it looks like an Italian election result. So now I'd have to think about it, uh, what kind of measures. But here you can have majorities, though. Yes, I can have a majority with number one and number two. I would uh, also have preferred that, because number four is a very uh, long-term measure. And uh, number three has the problem that tourism today is a kind of a democratic right. And uh, therefore, it would be very difficult to want to suddenly uh, rise, raise the prices so much that uh, most people can't afford them anymore. Thank you very much for this estimation. And therefore, just in time, we're coming to the end of this uh, session. I'd like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Schmude before David Annam comes back again. Well, if we want to have a conclusion, then we can say, okay, it seems to be a consensus that the phenomenon of overtourism is not a temporary one, a topic we're just talking about now, because there was nothing better to tell in summer. But no, we saw that even in the first uh, question we had here, that this is a phenomenon which is going to be and remain with us over the next years. Then something where we don't know yet uh, what to do, you know, that's something where we have controversial discussions, for example, about steering via the prices. You said that. Uh, does that mean that uh, we are reversing the process of democratization of travel, and are we making travel into this elite so good as it was 200 years ago? Now, whether that's the right thing, that's something I would also have my doubts about. Something which is uh, often, which is also very clear is the fact that there's no one-size-fits-all size solution, which uh, people in tourism very often uh, expect from us as scientists. They say, tell me what to do, what's the recipe? How can I cook the meal so that everybody will like it? And again, I think that uh, lots is to be done by researchers. And uh, I'm sure that we will get back to this topic and we'll not talk about this just once as intensively as we did today, but we will be doing this over the next few years again. And therefore, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Eminem. Thank you very much, um, gentlemen, for this very insightful study and some, of, some ideas of where we might frame some of the solutions. Um, so in 15 minutes, um, we will start a panel here with some representatives from some of the destinations that are affected by over-tourism, and I think we'll take some of your suggestions into that discussion and see what they have to say about that. So thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. and. Vielen Dank. Dankeschön.